joining us today. This is the Ken McElroy Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. Hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, and today we are going to jump right into it. We're going to be discussing property management. Yeah, I get these questions a lot. I, I totally get them. It's kind of, the, it's a business I grew up in and, um, you know, it's the hardest part of owning real estate. Yeah, so let's start with the most basic question. So when should somebody move from self-management to hiring a property manager? Yeah, that's a good one. So this is always kind of the million dollar question, you know, do I manage it myself or do I hire somebody? Uh, well, first of all, you have to have the time. So this is not a, like a stock investment. You know, a lot of people confuse real estate. Real estate is a full business. There's a lot that goes on. There's live people, you know, living in places and, and there sometimes can be very needy. So you, you know, if you're out of state, you, you have a massive disadvantage. If you're local, obviously yeah, it's easier if you can, you, if you can be able to run by the place or, uh, you know, visit often or, you know, because tenants, they, uh, they need attention and they definitely yeah, need so attention. Time is uh, something. And then I think a lot of people discount the amount of work. So, and then the experience and the knowledge, you know, there's a, there's a number of things from, from the lease and from how they pay, you know, I was even talking to my sister this week. Uh, you know, she has a commercial building and, uh, you know, the tenants, uh, they haven't paid for months and she called me and, and, and I, and she's like, wow, we never collect uh, late fees. I'm like, well, that's your problem. Like you've enabled that behavior forever. So they think that they can do it. So there's all these little things that, that, um, from the experience side. So now you can learn that for sure. And no, I'm learning it. I mean, yeah. I self-manage my own properties, but I mean, 
you just have to have the time to do it, like, and the patience to do it. So yeah. it's not, I wouldn't say it's a ton of work, but it tends to be at inconvenient times. Pe- yeah. There, there are things that you will never believe <laughs> yeah. happen that you texts and emails and calls that you get and you have to deal with them all. Well, yeah. I mean, I, about two months ago, um, one of my, uh, places, it was flooding. There was a pipe that had burst, uh, in the wall on the condo complex at of course, 11 o'clock at night wouldn't happen any other time. Uh, so, you know, we had to get an emergency plumber out there, you know, and I had to drop everything. I mean, luckily it was during the week and I was just home, but if I would have been out and about doing something, you have to stop everything and handle it. Yeah. Those are, those are real things, you know, fires and floods and yeah. Pest control issues and, and, uh, you know, neighbors and, uh, oh, yeah. you know, there's just a number of things that, that happen everywhere. And, yeah, and just little things happen and you have to deal with it. I mean, you know, yeah. you got to call whoever and, and call the city or whatever you need to do for your tenants or because yeah. something happened. Not and, to mention the accounting and the reporting and yep. all that, which yep. is something that you're definitely going to need if you want to buy another one and another one. You, yeah. you, that all has to be really, really done very, very well. But you also, you know, it's also not that hard either. You know, I managed three of them. I didn't have any, any experience and I kind of learned as I went and it was totally doable and I, I'm still learning, but it's totally doable. You just have to have the patience and then also the time to do yeah. it. In the beginning, I, I, what were you were spending what, a good five hours a week on this stuff, probably? Uh, no, I would say probably maybe a couple hours a week. A couple week. hours a yeah. week. Yeah. So, yeah. but you know. The, the hardest part I think, you know, is when I have a vacant unit, I then have to, or I have somebody moving out, I then have to show it to re-rent it. So that's usually about, you know, a week or two or three week issue where, I have to keep going down there and showing the place. That's probably the most work, honestly. Well, you got to get it ready. Yeah, no, I have to get it ready. Paint. I have to flip it. I have you know do all think, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, think paint, clean, maintenance, and then you got to put it out on the internet, mm-hmm. marketing. Then you have to show it, and you have to drive down there, and you have to you know, run the credit, and you know there's a bunch of little things that that uh, uh, yeah. clearly when there's turnover, it's. Um, much harder than uh, if it's occupied. Yeah. And I mean, I think also setting the correct rental rates, you know, as we had said, you can use uh, Zillow. If you have a property management company, you can use them, which is obviously going to be better and more accurate. Um, That's kind of step one, you know, having the right lease, choosing the right tenants, dealing with tenant issues, which is obviously the hardest, you know. And we have uh, sample leases and sample move-in forms and stuff on KenMacroy.com. If you're signed up to be a premium member. Yeah, so you guys can go there and look at all that stuff and just take a look. There's, you know, when I first got in the business, the leases were like two pages. (laughs) Now they're like 10. And, and, you know, as you start to learn things and as new things come up, you, you know, your leases get longer obviously to protect both parties. And when you need a very tight lease, you you know, you need to always make sure you have a lease and that you've run that credit and background check and you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's because that's going to be a big difference between a nice smooth rental, you know, owning a property process and a very bumpy and difficult one. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, when there are issues and there will be, it all goes back to the contract. (laughs) All the time. doesn't matter if you're in a partnership or you're in a lease. It's the same thing when you own a car or bought a TV or whatever. And you, you know, it all goes back to that agreement. The typically people don't read them they sign them. And, uh, but that's what it all boils down to. And, and I think, uh, one of the biggest mistakes people make is sometimes even, even landlords are self-managed. They don't know really even what's in their lease. (laughs) <laughs> they don't, right. They, they don't know. And so what happens is they don't enforce things in their lease and it can be very disruptive. So we've had situations where, um, y- you know, let's say you move somebody in and they're dealing drugs, which is a real thing. And um, that's very disruptive to the other people <laughs> that are living there that don't deal drugs, as an example. And uh, or maybe they're partying all night or, you know, whatever. So there's just a, you know, there's just a number of things that can happen that can disrupt some of the other tenants. If you have like a duplex or a fourplex or an eight unit or whatever. Or uh, if you just have one unit owned in a 50 unit complex. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a there's a you know there's a number of things that um, that can be mitigated on the front end, and uh, and I, it does kind of boil down to time and a little bit of experience. But you can learn it like you have. You know, you've self managed. Yep. Um, she's cheap. You know, she doesn't like to spend any money on anything ever. That's true. So, um, including property management. So, <laughs> you know, uh, me, I'm the other, I, I'm like, Hey, a good property manager, if I can give them a hundred or two hundred dollars a month and not have her have to, you know, talk to anybody, <laughs> you know, that's worth it for me. So you just got to kind of decide, you know, what's best for you. Yeah. And something else that I've kind of learned along the way is, you know, you don't want to get too close to the tenants. Um, they are your tenants. It's a business relationship. You know, my first tenants, it was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited you're moving in and what can I do? And, you know, and then it gets really hard to enforce a rule because you're kind of buddies, right? So it's got to be more that business relationship where it's all just straight to the point that way. doesn't mean you're not nice. You're just not talking about, you know, what you're doing this weekend and your kids and, and everything else that you're keeping it strictly business. And that way, when, you know, they don't pay rent or there's an issue, you can then address it properly and not having to worry about hurting any feelings. Yeah. And there, are, I remember on yours specifically, you, I think you rented to one person and her boyfriend moved in later. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yep. then there were some pet issues, you know, and so those are all, that's all part of the lease. It, you know, if, if, um, if, you know, if, if you have additional occupants or additional pets or anything like mm -hmm. that, those are all things that should be outlined in the lease. And don't think that it's going to be a seamless relationship, right? There's always some tensions in the tenant landlord relationship. So you could have the best tenant in the world, but there's going to be some things you're going to have to address. And it could be as minor as you can't call the handyman every five seconds for something minor. It could be somebody moving in. It could be them dealing drugs. It could be them not paying. But even these small things need to be addressed. And so you just really need to keep that professional relationship and enforce the lease and enforce the laws. Yeah. The biggest issue I've found is, is um, uh, in property management is enforcement. So, you know, uh, whether you're experienced or not experienced, it, you really do need to f enforce the lease to the letter. Yeah. And, and that's another thing to consider if you're considering property management on your own, self-management or hiring someone is, are you someone that can enforce the lease? Are you someone that's just kind of always like, oh, I feel so bad. It's okay. Because you might not be a good property manager if that's yeah, the case. That's a really good point. I, I, I think, you know, it, it's, I've seen owners getting taken advantage of big time by, uh, because they're, you know, they're like, Oh, they're so nice. We need to give them a break. Um, I have, you know, time after time, after time, after time. And I've seen, you know, <laughs> even without this eviction moratorium and this pandemic, you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of horror stories of, of, uh, you know, people are all, well, they, you know, they, 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 they pay me a little bit at a time and, you know, and, uh, you know, they're three or four months behind, and, you know, the place looks like crap and, you know, I don't want to boot them out cause I don't want to, you know, be that, that person. I understand all that, but, but, um, what happens is there are, there are people that will definitely take advantage of a situation. Um, and you really, really got to just manage it tight. If you don't have the, um, you know, the, the ability to be uh, a little bit confrontational on some of the issues that could come up in a lease uh, or on the rules or the regulations or, um, then it's going to be, it'll be tough for you. You got, and, and maybe you just need that person. Yeah, definitely. And you might just need that, be that, have that person to be the enforcer. Right. And that is the property manager, by the way. So yeah. that could be you, but yeah. you have to be able to call somebody out. Like, you know, if the rent's due on the first, and they haven't paid by the fourth or fifth, you, you should be all over those people say what's happening. You know, there's a, a late fee and uh, we're not waiving the late fee the, the, you know, the, and they need to understand that there's repercussions for not paying on time. And then what will happen is the next month, if they have to pay the late fee, they're going to pay on time. Well, and then also uh, to counter that on the other side of that coin is, you know, people want to like their property manager. So if you're a total jerk, and then have no sympathy at all, you might not be a good property manager either because, you know, people, you know, there are times where you just have to be a listening ear and understand. And, you know, I mean, you want to always yeah. enforce the lease, but you can't be a jerk about it either. Yeah. So we have a whole 
piece uh, called resident retention. So, you know, what happens a lot of times is landlords or property managers, they, they're they so focused on vacancies that they forget that they have clients and the clients are the people that are paying. So, you know, there's a retention piece around property management that is very, very important. And uh, that's responsiveness on maintenance. That's, that's uh, responsiveness on anything, you know, whether it's it could be packages um, or some rules and regulations or any issues that they might have that they're concerned about. All of those things require responsiveness. And all of that, if, if the tenants had a good experience, then generally they'll stay. And it's a lot cheaper to renew a lease than it is to find a new person. Because when somebody moves out, you now have vacancy by the day you now have potential marketing costs, you have time, you potentially have carpet cleaning costs or new flooring costs, you have maintenance costs, you have you know all of the things it takes to turn a unit and in addition to that, all the showing and you might even have to pay a fee to somebody as a commission to, you know, to help like, like you do with, with a lot of re real estate uh, salespeople. So there's a tremendous amount of money in a turnover of a unit. Yeah. And you're better off to have a great relationship with that tenant and have them renew than you are to have them move out. Exactly. And I think that there's, if you're going to self-manage, you need a handyman. You know, uh, I have Larry. You need a handyman on your team um, that's going to be able to respond to maintenance issues in a reasonable time frame. Um, because one, you know, you don't want to just be calling random handyman every time you need something because they might have a three week wait and it may be something that your tenant, once again, tenant retention, you don't want to have to wait, have them wait three weeks for a major issue to get fixed. Right. And there's always going to be kind of a push pull uh, uh, where the tenant says, well, I don't want anybody in there unless I'm there. And so then you've got maintenance uh, folks that might have to show up in the evenings. And, and, uh, and so let, let's say that you have, uh, let's say you're paying your maintenance person 40 or 50 an hour. You're, you're probably looking at at least a hundred bucks for them to, for some kind of a, some kind of a, a call, whatever it might be. And if there's two or three a month, you know, you're talking about two or $300 a month in maintenance labor potentially. And then in addition to that, you have whatever the cost is to the fix. So, so, you know, don't ever forget that, you know, these are real things. And so the ability to manage those costs is very, very, very important. It could be the difference of cash flow or no cash flow. Yeah. And also managing your tenant's expectations. So this is something that I am still learning and going to change moving forward. Um, you know, I used to be very accommodating with every little thing that needed fixed. But kind of what happened mm -hmm. with the pandemic or people are home all day now. So now I started to get in the business of, hey, this cabinet door is closing funny. Can you send the handyman out? And that would cost me $100. Well, that's not necessarily something that I have to fix if a cabinet door is just shutting a little bit funny, right? That's not something that I'm required to fix as a landlord. So if they want that fixed, you know, they can pay to get it fixed. But for me, it's more keeping the, the place livable and nice and for more, you know, medium to major issues. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it kind of goes back to the, the way it's handled. So mm -hmm. some people just throw maintenance people at it. And uh, obviously that's going to eat away at things. Um, and that's high, high, high customer service. It's going to cut into your profit. But you're right. You have to, um, you know, there are obviously some tenants that are, they're going to call you for everything. And there's some that don't even want to see you. Right. So. Well, and they can be good or bad. I mean, you know, some tenants that don't want to see you, your place could be falling apart and you would never even know. Right. But then, you know, others, you know, call you for everything. So you at least know your, your place is probably in pretty good shape. But I also think it's like a relationship where they're testing their boundaries too. Right. So they might not expect me to send somebody out when the cabinet is closing funny. But then when I do, I've now set a precedence that they can call me anytime for anything and I'll send somebody out. So you have to set the precedence of, hey, we'll handle this. But if you want certain things fixed, you have to handle that. I know we, we had I remember we have a tenant. So they'll call our office and say my, my light bulbs and my kitchens are out. <laughs> we're, yeah. And we're like, 
go buy some light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, go, right. Yeah. We'll have a maintenance guy help you put them in. Well, and that, uh, which, yeah. you know, actually we've done, you know, we've helped people do, you know, there are situations, you know, our, our, we want to have high customer service as well. Cause you want, but they, people can really push the envelope on this stuff. Yeah. And it is, and that is a good point. Cause it is different. Like you guys have large multifamily units, so you have maintenance people on staff. So if somebody does need, need their light bulb changed, you can do that. That's something to be very clear with people. If you own a single family unit, be clear with them that, Hey, just so you know, this isn't like a luxury apartment where you can call the handyman for every little thing and they just kind of show up in the next day or two. You know, this is a little bit different than that. And here's what's covered. Here's what's not. And I never had done that. And I'm going to start doing that on my leases moving forward. And I think it's really good advice for like the new investors. Yeah. And here's an idea. So um, there, there is an opportunity for your maintenance man to ha get more work from that tenant. So we've had situations where let's say, um, I remember we had an elderly woman who wanted a ceiling fan hung and some pictures. <laughs> and, um, so clearly that's not something that's, you know, falls inside of that. But, um, uh, uh, she paid the maintenance guy to do it. Like after so, hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't even, it didn't matter to me when I just said, like, I go, well, she's like, listen, I'll, I'll give you some money. So he got a little bit of cash on the side and, um, you know, it was a full win win. Yeah. And that's an option too. You know, that's part of the customer service. When your tenant calls you for an issue that you don't want to fix, instead of just saying, no, it's not covered. You can say, Hey, I get a special rate with my handyman. And if you want to pay him directly, you know, I'd be more than happy to extend that yeah. rate to you and have him do this work for you. It's just not part of what's covered in your lease. Right. Right. So there is that tactical middle, you yep. know, you don't yep. ever want to just tell somebody, no, you want to try to work with them. So it works for both parties. Yeah. The biggest issues are always typically around rent and late fees and they're around noise and kids and dogs and pets and parking. So those are kind of the things that are always revolving. So you just need to wrap your head around those things. And you know, something else surprisingly, but this has been an issue for a lot of my tenants is neighbor issues, right? Either your tenant's the problem or they have a problem with another tenant that's in the same building or in the same neighborhood. And, you know, you just just be ready for the drama. There's always going right. to be some stuff. You right. know? And if you're moving all the time and you're always having problems with a neighbor, well, that problem might be you. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. So I love my tenants that stay out of the drama. There's just not that many that do. Yeah. So um, and then one other thing I want to mention is kind of going cheap on repairs. So, you know, you have people that want to fix things and they want to do it on the cheap, but you need to be making sure that. Oh, I've you had know, this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys got to be careful on this one. So we've had like, oh, I'll paint the unit. You know, I've seen this. Oh, so they go and they buy the cheapest paint they can. And it's kind of half ass painted. I, we walked into places afterwards and you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, uh, you know, or a maintenance kind of the same kind of a thing. So. Um, now I had a tenant once, uh, on a, um, home that I bought, uh, while I was building another home, I actually had to buy another house to live in and, um, I rented it, uh, for nine years and this guy, he could fix anything. So, right. you know, so I trusted him and so he would call up and go, Hey, you know, I, you know, this happened, I'm just going to do this. I'm like, okay, great. And we figured out a number and then I just deducted it from the rent. And that's how him and I had that kind of relationship. And I'm talking about like uh, in nine years, we had two water heaters as an example. So he'd send the bill over for the water heater that he bought at Home Depot. And then, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe be a uh, couple hours to install or whatever. So, you know, every once in a while, you'll have that rare person. And, um, and so I just worked out, that's the deal that I had worked out with them. Yeah, it's case by case. But yeah, you don't want to say, oh yeah, I'm going to patch the walls and I'm going to paint and I'm going to clean the carpet myself. Yeah. And because then what happens is they do all that and it might not be up to your standards and then it's going to be an issue. So it's better to just say, listen, I'm taking all that out of the security deposit. You know, there's already a non-refundable cleaning fee. So that covers the cleaners and just kind of go, go with it that way. Yeah. Typically you're better off turning a unit the way that you want to turn for the next resident or next tenant. Very, very rare are you going to find uh, somebody who moves out and leaves the place perfect, uh, uh, re-rentable. So, uh, you know, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the 
grocery store and get one of those cheap carpet cleaning machines. I had a tenant and do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, those, it almost puts more dirt into your yeah, floor. Than... Yeah. And they're just not very good. So what you want is the professional company with the van and, um, you know, so there's a bunch of things that, um, that you learn as you, as you, as you move on. And, and, um, and I, I, I think, you know, you know, people are going to repair holes with like toothpaste and, you know, all these yeah. kinds of stuff happens and what you, you, you know, it's your unit and you want it to be perfect for the next person. Exactly. And there's one other thing I want to bring up, um, is when you do have to keep part of or all of somebody's security deposit. So for most of my tenants, it's been fine. It's been like a hundred bucks here, 200 bucks there. They get it. You know, it's part of the the fee or whatever. But there, I have had a tenant where I had to keep, you know, a, a much bigger portion because there was damage and yeah. there was all this stuff. And I was happy that I knew you, so I knew what to do. So you told me, make sure that I had my move-in, move-out form. So whenever somebody moves in, they have to fill out a move-in, move-out form, explaining, you know, how every, what condition everything is in, pictures of anything that's not in good condition. And then... I had that. So I had proof that these things were in good condition prior to them living there. Signed by them. Signed by them. So you so so when somebody moves in, the one of the biggest things is a move in check sheet. You go through every single thing and then they sign it. So basically acknowledging that everything's in good working condition. And if it isn't, then it should be on that sheet. Exactly. And then so then when you have your when you move out. Move out then you they're with you although my tenants weren't with me so they can not have to be i mean i asked them to be but they don't want to be right. sometimes and so i had to take pictures of conditions that everything else was right. in so i had proof that it was in bad condition before i sent my handyman in to clean it all up yeah so 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 what happens is obviously nobody wants to pay for anything and they want their security deposits back so then now you pull out the move in sheet and you look at the move out and you go line by line and say, okay, this towel bar is ripped from the wall. <laughs> okay, that, that clearly needs to be fixed. Or, you know, this, there's a dent in the front door or there's, you know, the slider is broken, uh, you know, or this window or this, uh, the screen is missing and boom, 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 boom. And you list them all there. And that is a dollar figure. And then take photos of everything. And then what you do is you have your maintenance guy go in and document all the work. And in your particular case, you actually had an invoice. Yeah, he had an invoice with everything with on it, everything of what it cost to, for me to pay him to fix, yeah. what it cost at the store to go buy, well, all the work that he did. Right. So then you show the invoice, you deduct it from their security deposit, then they go ballistic. So and they did, right? They were very upset. Um, unrightfully, you know what I mean? But, but they were upset, but, and they threatened to take me to court, but truthfully, and they never did, but truthfully, if they would have, I had all the documentation. So right. that's what the judge is going to want to see. They're going to want to see proof that you didn't just overbill them for stuff that wasn't really wrong or that that stuff wasn't already like that before they moved in. So as long as you have proof of both judges tend to err on the landlord's side, just the facts, ma'am. So, just the facts. That's all. You know? So yeah, it's like move in, move out pictures and an invoice that tenant will lose every single time and make sure everything's in writing you know you want everything in writing not oh yeah i showed them the the invoice it's like absolutely not it needs to be in writing email where you showed them the invoice and yeah. then you told me that you have to at least in arizona you have to get them their security de deposit back within is it 30 days so no it's i think it's 14 but oh, 14. um every state's a little bit different but here's the thing if you guys are holding somebody's deposit you um, there's a, a statutory requirement for you to let them know why you're withholding money and how much you're giving back within a certain period of time. So you just need to take a look at your landlord tenant laws in your state. But the, uh, that's a requirement. If you don't, if you miss that as a landlord or a property manager, then they, uh, there's repercussions for the tenant. So the land, there's a, you know, think about it. There, no, you're not supposed to be able to hold people's deposits for very long. Right. So, um, so that was the first step uh, and that had to be certified mail and all that. And that's when they got mad because they got a list of here's what your deposit was and here's what I had to deduct. Um, and, and that's kind of the whole point is to be able to, and if you can do that in person, it'd be awesome. But I will tell you from years and years of experience, 
when tenants move, oh man, like these units sometimes are in really rough shape, especially if they have pets and, and, and kids who wrote on the walls and, and spilled stuff on the carpets. And, and uh, generally people are moving and they're not cleaning the place and they're usually in pretty rough condition. So, so, um, you know, we're not in the business of, of, of getting people's security deposits. That's not an anticipated source of revenue, but it is something that you definitely need to have in place for when they do move. And not everyone's like that, but a lot of people are like that. Exactly. Like I said, it's only been one tenant for me that I've had that issue with. Other things have been super minor. You do, for me, I do $150 um, cleaning deposit that is non-refundable within the security deposit because you're going to want to hire professional cleaners. Once again, you don't want them to clean. You don't want to clean. You want professional people to come in there and flip and clean the unit for the next group of people. Right. So that should just be an expectation that this is non-refundable. That way they already know that you're hiring professional cleaners right from when they sign the lease and that they aren't going to get that 150 or whatever the number is back. Yeah. The, the other thing is I will tell you, uh, I've walked thousands and thousands of apartments and upon, uh, you know, and uh, so many vacancies, I can't even tell you. There are vacancies that you can turn over in, in two days, three days. Uh, and there are some that can take two weeks, mm -hmm. depending on how they're left. And so, you know, the the varying degree of, you know, abuse or use or whatever you want to call it uh, can range dramatically based on who's in there, what they're doing, you know, and if they have pets or kids or roommates or whatever it is. So just know that, you know, you can't I've had I've had, I, I you know, we've taken over properties where. Um, the guy was, you know, was doing motorcycle maintenance in his, in his living room and there was, you know, oil all over the place. We had, we took one where they cut a hole in the floor and they were actually cooking <laughs> oddly <laughs> enough. It was a, a family from outside of the U S and they took the oven rack out of the oven and cut a hole in the floor <laughs> and they were cooking. Um, and you can imagine, uh, when we found out later after they moved, um, obviously could have started a fire, but it didn't thankfully, but so they were literally cooking inside of the unit. There's all kinds of stuff that people do inside of their units and um, all kinds of damage that you can experience. Yeah. And, and that goes back to making sure you get a security deposit. You know, you definitely want to get a security deposit upon move in about one month's worth of rent is usually good. Um, but it needs to cover, you know, all your, yes. all the things that yes. could happen. All, and they will, trust and they me, will. and they will. But the goal is to give the money back. That's yeah. not, the goal is not to keep people's t deposits. That's no. not, the, that's not the point. Absolutely not. And point. if you're going to keep it, it needs to be legit uh, and you need correct. proof that it's legit. Yes. All right. So we're going to move over to premium. You guys should check out premium. You get total access to Ken for $19.99 a month. And we are going to be answering some questions. All we right. have some good ones today. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Nicole says, do you recommend buying now if I'm buying my first home versus a rental? So uh, it's a good question. I always think people should get into a primary residence if they can, because, you know, they're uh, building equity. And, you know, one of the biggest issues the millennials have, I don't know how old this, you know, person is, but is the... Um, if you look at their parents' generation, it's significantly off. And and, and um, most people's wealth are in the equity in their home. And I, mm -hmm. I, I just think that, um, so I always, I always say start there, build equity, and then use the, you know, a, a HELOC or whatever to go out and buy your next one. Exactly. I mean, if you buy the home and it goes down, so what? You have a fixed rate debt. Yeah. You know what your payment is every month. Yeah. You can't yeah. time it right. Yeah. yeah. You're you not going to rent your way to wealth. I like that. We should make a shirt like that. All right. Amy, how do I collect money from a tenant now that the moratorium is over? Knock on the door. <laughs> um, no, you know, there's uh, obviously there's a legal process in every state uh, it's, and, and, and county, and it's all very, very different. So you just have to follow the guidelines of wherever you are, and, and that's all. It could be so. difficult. It absolutely can, but it's a process. And, and, uh, I, I got, uh, actually the more, you know, they just lifted the moratorium and, uh, the next day I had a, a, a legal uh, opinion from, uh, uh, a law firm saying, this is, you know, this is how, this is some of the things that as a landlord you can do now. And, um, so every, every, every place is a little bit different you have to follow the law, obviously. And, um, and, but 
now it's just whatever the law was before it's new. Now you can do it. Yeah. And then also, you know, third party collection companies, is that an option for people or for what to collect the money after, mm -hmm. after they move out? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's really, really hard. I actually own a collection company. We have our own in house that we collect on people that, um, that skip and move out, uh, you know, owing and, um, so yes, you can. And, um, you know, it is a debt that's owed, but, uh, it's hard. You know, if you just turn it over to some collection company, you're better off trying to probably collect it yourself, <laughs> but there are things that you can do, you know, by putting it on their credit and things like that, that, that we've learned over time that, that do help. Great. So David is asking, can I have a pen? Can I have a tenant pay me cash? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can, um, the, um, I mean, obviously there's nothing wrong with taking cash. It's legal tender, but you know, you're better off doing reoccurring ACH you know, or, uh, you know, money that gets wired into your account. So that's what we do. So you imagine if we, you know, we have uh, 10,000 tenants and all of them are paying cash and you got people handling cash and going to the bank with cash. And so you're better off just having it reoccurring, just like a lot of people do on their bills for their utilities and things like that. And um, that's typically better. But yes, of course, you can take cash. Yeah, but let's talk about that, though. So if somebody pays you cash, you need to give them a receipt. Yes. And you need to make sure that you, you know, I would probably email it to them. Um, well, the burden is really on the tenant more than you. If somebody yeah. hands you cash and the tenant, well, doesn't, true. the tenant doesn't ask for a receipt, they're idiots. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like I've had that happen. Like we had, like, this is the funniest thing. We had a, we have a, a tenant put <laughs> the hundreds in this, in a, in a envelope from a bank and put it through a mail slot with their name on it. It dropped to the bottom of the floor. <laughs> So you can imagine like, you know, they, they paid, uh, you know, whatever it was, a thousand boxes sitting in the, some envelope with their name on it. Like anybody could walk in and snag that. Right. Um, so dumb. So, you know, you, you know, uh, the burden really is on the tenant because anybody could have taken that. And, That's true. I mean, it, right. Like they say that they paid you three months rent in a row. Say, they have to prove show it or us, whatever. Show yeah. us where, you know. So now. Uh, obviously we didn't do that, but the, the burden's more on the tenant. The tenant really is the one who needs the receipt. Yeah. So Jacob's question, if I have a roommate because I am house hacking, do I need a formal lease for them? Yes. That was a quick yes. Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, why would you do anything verbally? Like, you know, you, you button it all up. Doesn't even matter. You know, just make sure you have it. Make sure you have a lease that spells out all the stuff. You know, if somebody's moving in with you and paying you, you know, make sure it's all dialed in. Because, you know, what's worse than a tenant not paying you rent? A tenant that isn't? A tenant that's not paying you rent that lives in the bedroom next to yours. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. 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 For sure. And like if you a, don't have a lease to prove it, they could just say, hey, I, he just said I could move in for free. Yeah, you I'm going to guess there might be a little tension when you guys are out in the in the living room yeah. together. Just just. <laughs> Throwing that out there. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you definitely, you know, you want everything in writing, just like you would on a normal lease. You want how much they owe and all the stipulations and everything else. It's just, it's a, it's the same exact thing as if they were renting a condo from you. Yeah, exactly. So this is an interesting one. Emil from Premium is asking, when will the Fed implode? Wow. <laughs> Ask George Gammon. I don't know. Like uh, you George know. is a much better yeah. person. To and the Fed. That. He uh, go to his channel. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to implode. But um, I tell you what, they're they're uh, they're, they're they're testing their luck. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. The 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 thing the Fed. Um, you know, they they usually have that interest rate to be able to uh, tamper inflation, and uh, interest rates are so darn low that uh, that's not happening right now. So the Fed's, the Fed's gonna be under some scrutiny here, I think, uh, over the next couple of years because uh, we could see some pretty rampant inflation. Exactly. So, well, thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys next Monday. And don't forget to sign up for premium over at kenmacroy.com forward slash premium. Yep, see you guys. Cheers.